Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hike and Draw. This is our monthly nature drawing workshop where we go over a lot of the different things that we cover in the Hike and Draw drawing program. This is geared up for you to learn now in class and then take what you learn out into nature and uh, help teach other people a little bit about what you learned today too. So in case it's the first time you've ever been here, my name is James Sisti. I'm a professional artist and a wilderness guide. And today I have the privilege of being your instructor. This is uh, again, sort of a class that we, uh, we do once a month where we go over several of the different things that we do in our uh, online drawing program. And we're going to be talking about our goals, the kind of kit we use, things that you can use to help get you started. And then we'll do some exercises together. And then after that, we'll leave with a couple of notes on cultivating your practice and um, sharing your work. And then we'll have announcements in closing. So uh, this is the goal of nature drawing. It's to connect with nature and to do it in a way that has both intention and focus. It's a great way to kind of remove yourself from the hustle and bustle of your daily life and to find some silence and some presence in the, uh, in the great wondrous world of nature. Uh, it's also a great way to learn more about your environment and to share what you learn with other people in a very visual and meaningful way. So this is something that just like riding a bike, the more you do it, the better you get. So don't be discouraged if you're a new artist or if, if you feel like you're struggling with your artwork, that's okay. We're here to learn together. And the stuff we're gonna be doing today is going to be very approachable. And uh, again, the more you do it, the better you get. So today's class, very simple. All you need is a piece of paper to draw, a pencil and a pen. And if you wanna take what you learn in class out into nature, the kit that you should bring with you should be something you use all the time, something that's readily handy that you can just take out and start drawing immediately. This is a nice sturdy sketchbook. And again, a pencil and a pen, that's all you need. It's a very affordable hobby, it's very accessible. And if you wanna add more things to your kit, like color pencils or um, little measurement uh, devices, stuff like that, you can modularize as you need. The, the whole point of this is so that you're not carrying more than you need to. So if you want to continue with this after class, getting started, you got to keep it personal. You got to find something in nature that really excites you and makes you want to keep coming back to it. For me, I'm really into birds. I'm really into um, plants and doing landscape drawings. So that's whenever I'm hiking, I always have my sketchbook and I'm always on the lookout for those types of things. Um, and there's always other things that you can do too, in case you, you, you don't feel like you can draw out in nature because you know the group that you're hiking with always walks really fast and they never wanna wait for you. There are ways you can collect specimens and things like that very ethically without killing or damaging anything. And then you could always bring your specimens back home and draw them from the comfort of your, of your desk. So with that in mind, we're gonna start up with a uh, drawing exercise. And typically I invite folks to bring a nature object to class with them. Um, so this is the object that you're going to be using in this warm up exercise. But don't worry if you didn't bring one. I have a reference photo for you to use as well. And we're going to commence with uh, just a pencil and a piece of paper. So let's prepare our drawing surfaces. And uh, this is the reference photo you should have open. If you didn't get it in the email that I sent about an hour or so before class, then uh, you should see it in the chat. And uh, I'll put it there again, just in case you don't see it. So I'm gonna switch over to my top-down camera now. And uh, that way you'll be able to see the materials that I have prepared for class. Okay. And again, I'm gonna put inside the chat the reference photo. And if you're watching the recording, you can find this link to the reference in the section below the video. Okay, so I have my standard pencils and eraser and a pencil sharpener. Okay, and I'm just going to start with a regular piece of 8 by 10 inch printer paper. And you'll notice that I have three holes punched in my paper. And that's because I keep all of my drawings from class nice and organized and neat in a binder. So what I invite you to do next is simply to square off your page by drawing a margin. And this is so that we are clear as to the area we are responsible for as the artists, but also it's a way in which you can neatly add notes around your drawing 
and separate them in case that you're drawing inside of a sketchbook. Okay, so here we have our rectangle. And of course we have to write the date. So today is the 1st of May. It's my birthday month. It's also my grandpa's birthday month. He's gonna be 103, God bless him. All right, so we have our reference photo open and this is the reference photo of the butterfly. Uh, this is a living organism. Obviously, it's not a nature object, but nonetheless, we can still use the same type of drawing method that um, we use with objects to draw uh, wildlife as well. So what I invite you to do right now is just to consider the space in which it occupies in your frame. So I usually go with um, a, a system that features dots, and dots are the simplest form of mark making. Anybody can draw a dot. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider how long or wide this butterfly is. So I'm looking at its wingspan and I, and I put a dot from tip to tip. Okay, so I have two dots representing the width, the approximate width of the butterfly. So now the length of the butterfly, okay, from the tip of the head, we're not going to worry about the antennae just yet, but from the tip of the head to the base of the wing, okay, that's going to be the uh, approximate length. So we have the width and the length, and it kind of is a little bit of a diamond shape. So what I'm going to invite you to do next might be a little bit unorthodox for you, but think about it like this. An architect always begins a project by putting a plan on paper, right? And we construct our drawing similar to how a, a contractor would construct a building based on a blueprint. So using this rough estimate of width and length, what we're going to do next is use a series of dots to plot out the coordinates of our specimen here. And we're going to make an outline. And this is technically not the beginning of the drawing yet. We're still in the planning phase. So this gives us a great uh, advantage because what we're doing is we're considering the dimensions and the proportions of this subject so that when we do get to the drawing part, we'll have confidence that we are not only correctly to scale, but also to proportion. And we'll be able to make edits as we go, right? We're not, we're not interested in mistakes. There's no mistakes right now. We can make choices and measurement decisions in the form of uh, these sort of dots, these coordinates, and we can measure and remeasure as many times as we like until it feels right. Okay, and that way we're not worried about making mistakes. We're only worried about making accurate measurements. Okay, and this is all based on sight. So you're just uh, giving it a, an estimate. It's not something that you have to be critically um, accurate on. Okay, so here's the body, the top of the body here, right where the head is. The antennae will come from here. And then we walk around the length of the whole wing. Okay, it's got a lovely texture on it. Okay, lovely pattern too. We'll worry about that later. Okay, just walking around the base of the wing. Okay, up to the part where we reach the upper section on the right hand side. Okay, and now we have this part of the body here as well. Okay, and the body comes down like around here. Okay. And we have the, the building blocks or the blueprints for our specimen. Okay, and let me go ahead and adjust the light here a little bit because I am using a light, uh, a light pressure. Here we are. A light pressure so that the dots aren't too strong on the page because we're gonna we're not gonna be tracing these dots, but we're going to be drawing on top of them. So you don't want to press too hard on your paper because then it's going to be harder to erase the dots and, and it might um, disrupt your drawing a little bit. Okay. So I'm just going to adjust the light a little bit more. Okay. There we go. And when I begin, uh, my, the net, when we begin the next step, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding line to our drawing. 
on top or um, around our dots. Again, we don't have to trace. So just looking at the tip of the butterfly, um, the head of the butterfly over here, right? We have the, the face. Okay, and this is the part where it connects to the body. And we also have those lovely little antennae here and here, those little nodes at the tip. Just like that. And it's nice if you could sneak out into your garden, especially in the warm summer months, and catch a butterfly while it's relaxing on top of its flower and just to absorb, just to observe it, not to hurt it, not to keep it, just to observe it closely and maybe get a good sketch out of it. Okay, so what I've done is I've just used these little coordinates that we put down as guidelines, okay? Now you can see here, all right, that I'm not tracing the dots verbatim, okay? They're just there as a guide, okay? And you're gonna notice different parts of the wing structure that we'll expand upon as we, as we finish doing our outline. And the thing that I really enjoy about this type of um, insect is that its wings are just so brilliant. There's a lot of color, there's a lot of pattern, and they communicate different things to the animals around them. Typically, it's to ward off predators, or it's to camouflage, or it's to attract mates. Color is a very important thing in the insect world. And insects can see a wider range of color. Well, some insects can see a wide, wider range of color than we can. They can see, for example, bees can see an ultraviolet. Okay, so I'm just going and I'm just following the perimeter of this wing here. I'm not really concerned too much with the patterns yet. I'm just looking and seeing how these wigs, wings are segmented a little bit. And if you look and you work your way down the body just a little bit, you'll start noticing there's the nice shadow that lies across this section right here. Okay, and you don't have to be too concerned with the absolute accuracy, but just close enough. Just get it so it's close enough. Okay, and I'm not pressing that hard at all. Spending my time being nice and light and loose. Channel the butterfly. <laughs> okay. Just like that. So I started seeing butterflies as I've been hiking, usually the really small white and purple ones. And I'm definitely keeping an eye out for the larger species, but I don't know if they've come up this far north yet. So what I'm doing now is we're gonna start by just expanding a little bit from the base, the base of the body here. And if you wanna push it a little bit further away, all you have to do is move the line slightly like that. Not too worried about erasing or anything. Again, we're not concerned with mistakes. We're concerned with measurements. And as we draw, we are allowed to actively edit from where we started. Okay? Because we're thinking like our architects first and artists second. Okay. And as we come up this side, I'm seeing that it might be might be nice to make the wing a little bit longer on this side just to help with the perspective. So what I'm going to do is actively edit and go beyond what I originally planned, just a few centimeters, okay? So to give you a little look, here's where, where I originally eyeballed the measurement right around here. So I'm extending the wing just a couple of centimeters forward 
and I'm going to bring it around a little bit uh, because I think it would be nice to have a little bit more surface area just like that so that it's truer to the form in our reference photo. Okay. And you can see I didn't have to erase. I didn't have to worry too much or fuss about it being perfect. All I did was just extend my line a little bit. And now I'm happy with the proportions of the specimen. So what I invite you to do next is if you see anything that you want to get rid of, if there's excess marks that you made that you don't need anymore, now is a good time to just get in there with your eraser and clean up a little. And I like using an, a kneaded eraser. These are typically gray and uh, rubbery. And uh, they're great for a variety of different mediums. I like using them with pencil, color pencil, and even charcoal. And they're great because they can literally lift the material off the page. They're very kind to the paper. So you won't get any distress if you erase with this. Sometimes we use the uh, old school, uh, old school erasers, the pink ones, remember those? And those will tear the paper if you use them too roughly, but the kneaded erasers don't do that. Okay, so next what we're gonna do is we're gonna give this little guy a place to stand. So if we follow this piece of foliage down to the bottom of the page, we'll note how it arcs up through the back of the wing here and continues off like this. Okay, same on this side. We're gonna say maybe three or four centimeters from the wing. I'll have this piece of foliage come up here and then maybe there's another one that kind of crisscrosses off just like that. Okay. So now that we have a little place for this butterfly to stay, we can consider some of the shadow that we're looking at on the underside of the wing. And I'm just gonna mark that off with a very, very faint line Okay, because I'm going to come into that area later. Now for the body, okay, we're going to look and we're going to see how it's rounded. So I'm going to make little marks like this around the body, following the contour of the body, just like this. Okay. See how it's following the roundness of the body. I'm gonna try to get that as close to the camera as possible. Okay, that's gonna help me out when I'm trying to convince the person looking at this that it's a round butterfly. Now we have a very large eye right here and I'm gonna leave a little bit of that eye blank so that it looks like a shine or a reflection. Um, and there's a little bit of hair around the eye as well or fur, fuzz. <laughs> There we go. Same thing on the other side too. It almost looks like he has a nose. Almost. <laughs> okay, and where the antennae attached to the head. Just want to anchor those evenly. Okay, and let me show you what I got right there. Okay. And I'm just gonna follow the roundness of the body all the way down to the tip. And I'm just using some nice light loose marks, nothing fancy. It almost looks like a transparent silky texture down there, right? Part of the wing is maybe overlapping the body. Now we have some really interesting textures and patterns. So this is something that we can pay a little bit more close attention to. But again, it's a, it's a unique pattern. Every butterfly has a different pattern. Okay, similar to how we have different fingerprints. 
zebras have different patterns too. There's no, there's no two zebras alike. <laughs> Very interesting. So to get this to feel more organic, what I'm doing is I'm just making individual lines that are spaced out ever so slightly, ever so slightly down the length of the wing. And you leave a little bit of white space in between because you wanna leave a little bit of room. You want it to feel like these are the uh, scales on the wing and that they're kind of like, they think about them like pixels, right? What happens when you zoom into a pixelated image all the way? Eventually what you wind up with is different squares, right? Separated different units that when combined, they form a whole picture. Okay, that's kind of what we're gonna think about as we progress with our pattern on our butterfly wing. And if you find things that really help you more accurately place the pattern, like for example, I'm looking at the edge of the wing and there's a little bit of white space, then there's a smaller ring, a larger ring. It almost looks like it has a little eye there, which might be intentional. Then we have another little ring here and then several others. You don't have to make it perfect. People will know that you're drawing a butterfly and that the pattern was, is good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. And this is just our warm up sketch, so we don't have to be all the way tuned into this. Just get loose. Just let, get used to the feeling of your pencil on the paper. Get used to your different types of mark making. Okay. And for the shadow underneath, all you have to do is just make some lines like that. Don't have to worry about making it too detailed here. Okay. Same thing here. We have those lovely eyes, probably to ward off predators. Now some butterflies broadcast to predators that they're toxic with the type of color palette that they have on their wings. And since nature is tricky, there are non-toxic butterflies that copy the pattern of the toxic butterflies so that predators don't eat them. That's a wonderful evolution there. And the reason that happens is because whatever has the, the highest chance of survival, that will pass on its genes. And, and the genes that are more suited towards survival are the ones that become more dominant throughout the gene pool over time. And if that's the way, if that's what if that's the trick that helps the species survive, then most of those butterflies that are not toxic will look toxic and will most likely not get eaten by a bird or a predator. And because nature is amazing, they thrive. Okay. So let's go over here to the other wing and I'm just gonna note where the upper part of the wing attaches to the body, right around here. Okay, and we have some veins that come around. Less veins, more like structural filaments or Great. 
So I'm just looking to see where they attach to the wing and to the body, where they split off, similar to the veins in the leaf, right? No pressure. You know, and if you look at this critter long enough, you, be, you begin to understand why the pattern is the way it is. And you can maybe ad lib a little bit, create your own pattern based on what you're seeing. And that way that butterfly is uniquely yours. And who knows, it might exist like that out in nature somewhere. Okay, so just playing around here, with those little eye shapes. You have that nice ribbon that comes through. And if you think about it, you're out on a hike, you get to draw for five minutes or so. Think about how you'd want to speed up your drawing a little bit and what elements you keep and what elements you leave, you leave out. And for elements that you leave out, you could always supplement your drawing with little notes. For example, this is just a regular pencil drawing, right? We're not using color. So if, for example, I wanted to supplement my drawing with notes, I can say, put a little arrow here, kind of like a textbook diagram. And I can say gray wings. with black ribbons and white orange black and then in quotes we can we can put eyes So I'm just gonna get a little bit more of that ribbon on the tip of the wing there. Really warm up my hand with this type of mark making. Because when we go into the next exercise, when we get into our robin, we're gonna be using a similar approach. We're gonna set up our drawing just the same way. We're gonna be playing with more texture. We're gonna be playing with more line variation. I'm going to get a good artist's workout. Okay, like I said, it's just like riding a bike. The more you do it, the more easy it comes to you, the more fun it is too. That's a cool ribbon, just swirls around the top, swoops underneath. Very graceful, almost like musical notations on a line. I guess they call that a scale, musical scale. Now let's make the line slightly darker where I see the division. Okay, and I'm not seeing any legs, so we can leave those. Okay, and there we have it. Now you could also add things like measurements. You can write down the location. You can write down the name of the specimen if you, if you understand uh, your, your butterfly species better than me. <laughs> so um, yeah, we can give it a space. Let's say we uh, found this little guy in the garden. Maybe you can say what type of plant it was found by, right? Maybe we could say found by the daffodils.
in the back garden. So because we have our location, we have our date, we can know when to start looking for these critters during the year. Because maybe they, they just show up in the beginning of May and then they'll leave in the end of summer. Okay, so that's our warm up drawing as you have it. And what we got next is a, let me share my screen with you. Is a, another wildlife drawing, okay? So we're gonna go into a little bit more detail here. And you know, now that we're all warmed up, I'm gonna teach you a little bit about um, using your using your pencil in a way that will have the mark making be a little bit more advanced, but don't worry. This is a way in which we can help uh, render different textures and uh, whether it's for foliage on plants or uh, feathers or fur on, a, on, a, on an animal or even scales on a reptile. This is a great technique to use. We're gonna think about visual hierarchy and how our subject dominates the frame. And we're gonna use our margin to plan our drawing out with our connect the dot method. And um, we're gonna be paying close mind, here we are, to the texture. I really liked this reference photo because look how ruffled the feathers are on the front, on the breast of that American robin. And I thought, <laughs> I thought the scientific name was pretty funny because I think their namesake is quite accurate, especially if you park under a tree where they live. Um, so we'll go ahead and share top-down camera now. Okay. And in case you're looking for that reference photo, I put that in the email prior to class, but I'll also drop it into the chat again. So there you go. And if you're watching the recording, we have that link at the bottom under the video that you can click on and access that picture. Okay, so I'm switching out paper. I now have a nice thick piece of five and a half by seven and a half inch cardstock here. And I'm going to start my drawing just like I do every other drawing. And that's with a margin. And I invite you to do the same at this time. These are also nice to do because if you ever frame your work, it gives you a little bit of space to mount your drawing. So that way you can have a nice little border around your picture and you're not cutting anything off. All right, today's date is the 1st of May. And the specimen we're gonna draw, I'm just gonna write the specimen name on the top on the upper left-hand corner. Uh, is the American Robin. Okay, and the scientific name we can put in parentheses. Curtis migratory, migratory, <laughs> migratorious, there we go. So these birds do migrate. However, some of them do remain behind in the winter where I live in New York as well. Okay. Ah, wet my whistle a little bit of water. Okay, so time to plan our drawing. What we're going to do is very simple. We're gonna look at the height of our specimen and the space in which we would like it to occupy within our frame. So I put two dots to represent the height of our robin. Now the width of our robin, okay, it's gonna be a little bit off centered here because the tail, the very tip of the tail is over here somewhere. Okay, so I put a little dot there. And I'm gonna to look to see where the rightmost point of the bird is, and that's gonna be where the breast is. So that's right around here. Okay, so overall, my robin should, in theory, fit inside of this little diamond, and you can barely see the dots that I put. I put one, two, three, four dots for the height and the width. 
okay, of the bird. Okay, and what we're gonna do next is the same exact thing as before. We're gonna use our, um, our architect's trick and we're gonna start by just plotting the coordinates of our, of our specimen here. So I'm gonna go to the very top where the top of the head is and I'm going to very, very lightly begin creating an outline of the bird using dots here. Okay, and I wanna make sure that my proportions are correct. So I might do it a couple of times. If it feels like it's too small, I could start again and just explore the space with my pencil. Okay, I'm not worried about making mistakes. I'm only worried about measuring and planning my drawing. Okay, during this planning phase of your drawing, it's okay if you're feeling a little bit lost, if like you're worried about it not having the right shape or the right proportion, this is the time to experiment, okay? Because we, we, again, we haven't started our drawing yet. Like if we feel like the beak is too thick, for example. Well, we can always just add dots that feel more accurate and leave the ones that we put down first behind that can stay. We don't have to worry about erasing that yet. And that way we have a comparison of the marks we just made with our new marks. Okay, so here's the head, right? And the head's a grayish color. You have some black and some white and some gray, a lot of great colors in there. And then the body itself is, the breast is like an orange with some white, um, some white feathers in there. This might be a juvenile, right, right, right before adulthood. Still see some of those lighter feathers in there. Okay, so it's all fluffed up. Maybe it's cold, right? So we have our beak. Okay, we have part of the head that comes up here where it connects to the back of the wing. Okay, and we follow that. All the way around. Okay. So then we have the other side of the wing there, the under side of the wing comes down a little bit, right where we have our dot. Okay. So for me, I maybe have a little bit of a calculation error, but one cool thing you can do is just proceed with your drawing. And if the tail, for example, breaks the frame, that's okay. Kind of has a 3D effect to it. I often let my subjects wander outside of the frame I put up. I think it has a bit of charm to it. Okay, so just goes to show you, if you planned your drawing and you're subject doesn't fit inside of that original parameter that you put, that's fine. Okay, this is where I originally intended the tail to end, but that would have meant that my Robin's head would have to be the size of a nickel or a dime, that's too small. So I just compromised by pushing the tail outside the boundary and now I'm exploring two different spaces, that of uh, the drawing inside the box and the drawing outside the box. So now I'm just gonna wander my way down. Here's the bottom of the wing to the bottom of the belly here. Okay. And this part's easy because it's very round and it's, there's a lot of ruffled feathers here. So there's plenty of room for experiments, experimenting. Okay, and this is where the legs come down. Okay, here's one. There's a little bit of space in between the legs with some feather texture here. Okay, and here's the top of the foot. Here's the back of the knee right here. Okay, connects to the ankle. 
Okay, and the feet are sort of blocked by a piece of foliage. So that, with that in mind, we can add some of these background elements. It looks like we have a branch here with some early spring buds. All the foliage in my part of New York is really starting to pop now. The oak trees, the maple trees, all of the pear trees have leaves now, the cherries. Though the American black cherry is a little bit slow. The cultivars like the Kwanzaan cherry, for example, they all have their foliage out. Most of their flowers dropped. But the good old American black cherry, that one's slower. So we'll see some foliage on those first before we see those little white flowers that will eventually become the cherries. Okay. And we have some foliage up here too. I just want to maybe hint at the shape of the foot a little bit better here. Now, when a bird lands, right, let's pretend my hand here is a claw and this is a branch, they'll grip like this. Okay, there's almost like a little automatic mechanism. They can't help it so that they don't fall off the branch while they're sleeping at night, basically. So if that's the way this bird is perched, okay, let's say, for example, we invent a little bit here. If we know what a bird's foot looks like, right, we can play a little bit and maybe imagine how it would be hanging on to a branch here. Okay, just like that. Just like that. Okay, and the other one pretty much follows suit with what it's doing over here. Okay, but it, just in case you don't want to do that, which is fine, you can go ahead and play with a little bit of foliage here. You know, simple leaf, just like that. There we go. Nice and light and loose. All right, so that's the plan for our drawing here. Let's go ahead and take a look at the reference photo again. Okay. Let's compare what we have. So our plan is basically the contour, the outline of our Robin, all right? now. When we start jumping in with texture, that's really going to be a fun, excellent way to bring more life out of this uh, out of this subject. But the best trick is to focus on the eye, and and whenever you draw an, uh, any kind of wildlife, if if you get the eye right, you're really going to help it feel alive. That's super important. So I want you to look at the beak that you have. I want you to make sure it's not too wide and not too long or too short, you have the opportunity to play around with the dots that you made, okay? So think about it like this, okay? If the head, okay, see how it's sitting on top of those orange feathers, okay? And it sort of comes up to this little area where we have the white feathers here, okay? Notice how the beak terminates here, okay? right before that section of white feathers. So you have this area of grayish feathers here, okay? And it sort of has a nice smooth motion to it. Okay, so that's where you can kind of gauge where the bottom half of your beak ends, like right around here where this gray blackish feather pattern starts. Because then there's this section here of white that comes up here. Okay, it's almost like a little curved rectangle. Okay, and you still have plenty of beak after that white section. Okay, so make sure you give yourself the right proportions there. Now, as you walk around the top of the beak, right, it's, you have this little slope, almost like a hill. Okay, notice how the eye is perfectly aligned with this beak. 
Okay, so if you draw a line from the very top of the beak, you're gonna hit the top of the eyeball. So make sure your eyeball isn't up here or under here. You wanna be able, if you were gonna just continue drawing a straight line from the, where the beak meets the head, you're gonna hit the top of the eyeball. Okay, now with the bottom of the beak, almost, just a little bit less, you know. Okay, so just get that proportion just so. All right, so let's start that together here. I'm gonna zoom in my camera as much as I can. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just analyze how, how I've done my beak so far. And to tell you the truth, I think I may, might have to adjust it slightly because it's pointing downward too. So I want it to, I do want it to curve, but I also don't want it to point downward like it was before. So I'll just make a little bit of an adjustment, a little bit of an accuracy check here. Okay, and that way I can go in with my eraser and remove some of the noise to make it a little bit easier for me. Okay. Now, if I just continue drawing that line over here, right, I'll be able to get where the eye needs to be, okay? So for example, if you look at the top of my beak and see how it travels through the head to where the top of the eye is, that's a little trick you can use. And if you just erase that little section when you're done, now your eye's in the right place and you don't have any access uh, marks getting in your way there. Okay. So I'm just gonna go ahead and make that little hill on top of the head a little bit larger there. Just like that, okay? Now with this section of I, what we can do is start by just getting the right size, right? And we don't have to have it be perfect, but just close enough. Okay, and I'm gonna leave a little bit of room. I'm gonna make some highlights on the eye, just like this. This is gonna help make the eye feel round. Okay, and I'm not going to color in the eye just yet because I have a little bit of work to do around the edge of the eye. Okay, I'm just gonna sink it in a little bit with a darker line around the perimeter. And then complement that by just making some dots or dashes around with the eyes embedded into the skull, just like this, and leaving a lot of white space between those marks. That's going to help the, uh, it's gonna help it make it feel like feathers. Okay, and we have this nice white pattern, okay, that comes up like this. And these patterns are also gonna help give us some answers as to um, what the right beak placement's going to be. Because if you follow this little white pattern here, it's going to touch part of the beak as it curves upwards towards the nostril. And if the nostril sits somewhere around here, okay, that's gonna help us to get a little bit more of an accurate placement. Okay, because this section is gonna be a little bit darker. And then there's a little white eyebrow, it looks like on the outside of that little circle we made. Okay, so there's that little white part and this is the little darker section here. All right, and all these little components, once you add them all up together, I know it takes a little bit of extra time and a little bit of extra energy, but it adds up so that you don't have to question whether or not something feels accurate or whether or not something feels in proportion, right? Because we're just worried about getting the, the nature of the specimen correct. Okay, so close enough is acceptable. It's okay. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Just close enough. Okay, and I'm just looking and seeing which way the feathers are growing. And I'm just making my marks in the direction of those feathers. Okay, and I'll just fill in a little bit here. 
the eyeball. And leave it kind of light. Okay, don't go too dark yet. Because there's opportunity to pull out more details later. Okay. So the nice big Robin's eye there. Okay, maybe if the head has a little bit taller of an angle, we can make that adjustment. That's totally fine because the eye will give you a little bit more of a perspective as to whether or not the head's shape is correct. So I'm just gonna make my peak a little bit taller. Okay, not a big deal. You can see where it, where it was originally. So all I did was bump it up like two millimeters. Okay, and I don't have to worry about making excess marks in there because we have a wonderful texture that we're gonna to use too. So we have the feathers that come onto the beak right around here. And if you need to, you can always change the way in which your, the angle of your page. Okay, it'll help you make a more accurate mark and that's okay, you should do it. Okay, and here's that beak on the underside now. Just like that. Okay, and remember I'm following it in to where that little white section ends, where that little darker grayer section begins. Just like that. Okay, and if you're, if you're feeling like you need to extend something, if you need to adjust an angle, don't be afraid to actively edit. Okay. So I'm just looking at the way in which these feathers are growing around the eye now. Following the direction of the feathers is a nice way to kind of help establish the texture in the rougher areas. Because when we get to the smooth areas, we're gonna have a, a nice easy way to fill in our values and shading. Okay, so here we have where the throat it's exposed that nice white pattern there. And in terms of where the borders are between the different layers of feathers, all you have to do is think about it like uh, shingles on a roof, okay? So the way in which the shingles overlap on a roof, very similar to these feathers here, alternate. Okay, so you have two on top, one underneath, two on top, one underneath all the way around. Or in case that doesn't work out for you, you can always just follow the little lines that you made earlier and just use a little bit of creative mark making just like this to show the border between the two different types of feathers. Okay, and you can grab your eraser and get rid of any excess marks that might be getting in your way. I've been playing with a technique where I just follow the contours of the surface with my pencil and I have a nice little sketchy, loose feeling. I'm not too worried about it being absolutely perfect. I'm just playing with the texture and the way in which the pencil feels in my hand. Just like that. OK, 
Okay, and if there's anything that you want to edit, feel free. Okay. So now that we've got this part down, let me show you the other way in which we can add some texture, okay? Because these are the finer details, the finer feathers, right? The around the eye specifically, there's a lot of information in there. So like just adding dots and things like that gives you a lot of, um, a lot of texture and a lot of freedom to add it or uh, enhance that feeling as much as you can, right? So if, for example, we're going to take a regular pencil here, all right? And I have, here we go, nice little trick for you. So notice how the tip of this pencil is flat, okay? So the reason why I do that is so that I can have a nice flat surface. Okay, you can just uh, make a, a, a little circular pattern on a piece of paper. I have a little fine chisel here, and this helps me to make my pencil point really flat. Okay, look at all that material there. It's like a little chalky powder now. Okay, so what I do is I take my piece of paper with my pencil and in, in the new flat tip, and I just begin making circles. And I'm not pressing down hard on the page, I'm just very lightly dancing over the surface. Okay. Nice and easy, just like that. Okay, and notice how I'm getting a nice even distribution of material here. That's what we're going to apply to these sections of uh, darker feather here on our robin. So for example, I barely press any pressure down on the page at all. It's just the weight of the pencil. And I go in there and I make these tiny light little circles and you're starting to see the texture or the tooth of the page really come out, right? Now we have certain sections that are just white feathers and we can leave those blank. That's totally fine. But everything else, picture it like you're applying a little coat of paint, right? And this is gonna be our base coat, nice light, even, and you can even see some of the marks that you made underneath this layer. Okay, so in the materials list, I, I mentioned using a special kind of pencil, a, a 2B softness, right? So that's the type of graphite that's in the pencil. It's a softer type of graphite that's in, your, uh, that's in this type of pencil than a standard pencil. So the reason why that's important is because I'm getting so much material out of this and I'm barely even pressing it down on the page. Whereas if you're using a harder graphite, like a number two pencil, that's, that's, that's an HB on the softness scale. Um, that's kind of harder. So you're gonna have to press into the paper in order to get that darker material out of it. And it's not going to have the same effect as this, unfortunately. So this is good if you have a softer lead or a softer graphite pencil, okay? Because if you want to go a little bit darker, right, we just put our little base coat down. So there's a little section around the eyes, right, that we want to make darker. You don't have to press hard at all. In fact, pressing hard is going to do the opposite. All we have to do, okay, is just spend a little bit more time in the same place using the same amount of pressure, making our little circles here. And that's just going to distribute more material into the page. Okay, so that's what's making it darker not the pressure, just like that. Same thing around the top of the eye here. If I wanna make this darker, I'm not pressing hard at all. Look at that. Getting a nice dark value, barely pressing down the page at all. Takes a little bit of time, but it gives you more control. Because if you ever feel like it's starting to get a little too dark, all you have to do is stop. You don't have to worry about erasing. Okay, and for little sections where we have more feather in there. Okay, we can use this to make some texture like that, like those little shingles I was talking about. Just by putting a little bit more material into the page, not even about pressing hard. 
just like that. Okay, and little sections where we have white, mostly white feathers. Okay, just get in there and visit that space with your pencil. Give it that little base coat. Okay. And again, in the darker areas, you're just spending a little bit more time with your pencil. You're not pressing hard into the paper. Okay, so look at that nice, lovely texture that we have on our Robin's head now. The eye looks like it's shiny, made out of glass almost. Okay, and the little ruffles that we're seeing here, those little shingles, that little overlapping pattern was simply spending more time with the pencil, um, not putting more pressure onto the page. Now, if you wanna get even more, you wanna pull even more texture out of this, you can switch back to your sharper pencil. Okay, I have another sharp pencil here that I'm gonna use because it's a softer material. And you're gonna put a really fine, fine, fine point on it. So I'm gonna do that as I speak. And I'm gonna hunt out some really, really detailed parts like um, maybe this underside here with my sharp pencil. I'm gonna go in there with my creative mark making again. I'm just gonna find a little border here between the dark and the light feathers. I'm just gonna, there we go, make some marks like that. Follow where those things overlap. Just like that. See, look how nice that looks. Just bringing out the work that we did already. Just adding a little bit more detail there. Okay, and it's a fine balance. You don't have to go too over the top with it. Okay, just those little areas where we have borders. We have some of these white feathers overlapping on top of the darker feathers. So it helps to use the sharper tip to help emphasize that point. Okay, and if there's a little darker section, the underside of the beak, for example. With a nostril. Okay, the little sections where the feathers overlap onto the beak. Nice and dirty. If you want to make it darker again, grab your flat chisel tipped pencil and just start making circles. If it gets narrow, you can just use directional strokes just like that. And remember value scales and proportions. So the darker you go in some spots, the darker you'll have to bring it to other places, but you just find that happy place where you're getting enough texture and enough value where it's satisfactory to your needs. Just like that. Right now you're seeing tons of texture in there. Since we have some of these feathers just interspersed, a nice little pattern inside of this little white area. There we go. And you can just see how diverse the effects are with your pencil. I mean, you can have 
ton of value, a ton, uh, you have a lot of texture. You have a lot of line quality, a lot of contrast. Pencil can be underrated for sure because it is indeed a powerful tool in your arsenal. And I'm just walking my way up this hill in front of its head here. Just like that. Making sure that those feathers look like they're overlapping a bit on the top of the head for finding the steep back end of the head, just like that. Maybe extending it a little bit slightly. There we go. Letting it overlap. There's our robin's head. Okay, same thing for color pencils. Okay, so if you're working with color pencils, this can also help um, you blend your colors and to uh, mix and match so that your specimen looks and feels accurate. Okay. So, Normally what we do is we'll continue into the next exercise and we'll do some rapid sketching. Um, I think it would be fun to continue and finish this exercise together. Um, but if we can't get all of that texture in there, at least we can get the contours, all right? So moving from the head, I'm gonna select my sharp pointy pencil and I'm going to now walk my way down the front side of the breast here. Now that's gonna be relatively smooth. Now in the sections where we see more ruffled feathers, okay, I'm gonna leave a little bit of room for the imagination, meaning I'm not gonna use a, a solid line and, and make it flat, okay? I'm gonna leave a little bit of room for the imagination. I'm gonna let it just be a series of marks that are maybe, maybe they have a lot of white space in between them. Okay, I want them to feel ruffled. I want them to feel loose. So I'm just gonna walk my way down the front of the body here with that in mind. Okay, see we have a lot of these little feathers sticking out, a lot of overlapping happening. I just want a lot of white space in there, just like this. Okay, so I start with a solid line from the top of the head here, and then I walk my way all the way through the body, leaving some room for the imagination. Okay, I can go in there with my sharper pencil. And since this is a smooth texture here, I can use a smooth line. Rough texture is, a, uh, is not a smooth line. It's a lot of, uh, it's a series of marks. Okay, so if you wanna get in there and use your chisel tip pencil to fill in the leg, you can go in and make little circles like this, or you can use directional strokes like a paintbrush. Okay, and in the areas where you need more material to spend more time or do some extra strokes, you don't have to press hard into the paper at all. Okay, same thing on this side, we have that little knee. Okay, we have some feathers overlapping, just like this, nice rough texture. Look at that, very cool. You have that Robin's foot clutching the branch it's sitting on maybe. I know it sounds silly, but I've been practicing some bird calls. <laughs> and the other day I called a couple of morning doves into the yard. <laughs> yeah, it's James has gone off the deep end, folks. 
It's talking to birds now. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and use our chisel tips pencil and just put a nice little base coat in there. Nice light circles or directional strokes, whatever you prefer. And there's going to be a highlight in here. So we want to want, we want to make sure that there's a nice uh, value contrast. So you either leave some of it blank or the other thing you can do is just apply a, a nice even base coat very, very light and loose, okay? And then using those single directional strokes, just add material to those darker areas. Very, very light, very, very loose like that. Nice and sketchy too, you don't have to make it perfect since we don't actually see the foot in this image, okay? Let's continue. So around the perimeter, I'm going to come up from this side here, and it kind of overlaps, right? So we have a little overlapping uh, action happening in here. Okay, so leave some room. And then there's going to be a smooth section right there. Okay, so this overlaps to the point where we get to the base of the wing. Okay, so we have the base of this wing here. Let's extend that very loosely. Just bring it up into the body. We'll worry about all the other stuff in just a little bit. Okay, so we have this nice wing here following those contours. Okay, and we can actually start here at the top of the, at the base where the neck meets the body and just kind of walk our way around. We have some overlap here, with those orange breast feathers. Okay, where it meets the wing. It meets this section of the wing, and then that final section of the wing right there. Okay, we also have a little tail that comes out here, but there's a piece of wing folded up maybe from that other side that tucks its way in here. Okay, before we get that tail feather. Just like that. If you look, it's a lot of tail feathers overlapping. It's not just a single unit. Okay, and mine's slightly off, but that's okay. I like to cross over that little threshold. Okay. And now we just have these nice little overlapping feathers here you can play with. Nice, and I'm just doing it light and loose right now. I'm, I'm creating the guidelines because what I'm going to do or what I suggest that everybody does next is um, just revisit these little areas with your chisel tipped pencil and apply a base coat and then bring out the different values just by spending more time making those circles in this little space. And then after you can get in there with your sharper pencil and you can bring out more of the detail like we did in the head. Okay. And I just want to spend a little bit more time focusing on a single subject this class, rather than having us do three or four different exercises, because I think it's nice to just feel some pause every once in a while and go over the basics in more detail. Okay, so the same thing, you know, we have these really great textures happening 
all these nice ruffled feathers that overlap each other. And you just spend a little bit of time making some marks in there, honing in on the areas that are noteworthy. There's a little bit of a area of separation here in the middle. You can see where they come together and sort of form a scale armor. <laughs> looks like scale armor. I have pangolins on the mind. <laughs> okay, and we have some interesting textures in here. Lovely, lovely bird. Just gonna get those textures too, those nice little ruffled areas, because that'll also help when you consider the different values you're gonna apply. Okay. You wanna know where those values are really gonna to need to pop. So that's why I create these little guidelines, these little borders in between sections here, just like that. Cause you can visit it with your chisel tip pencil, get the tones, get the, the values that you need rather, and then revisit it with your, revisit them with your sharp pencil and be able to pull out finer details just like that. Okay, nice, rough, loose feathers. Look at that. You can just notice how some of these Feathers are just following the contour of the body as they overlap each other. Following very, very delicately the roundness of our robin. The nice thing about that little circle technique that I showed you earlier is that you get to see the marks that you made underneath very, very easily. So you're not losing all of that work that you did. Again, playing with some of those directional single stroke marks like this helps to really show the contour of the specimen. See how they start this way and then they work their way in an upward direction. And then by the time you get to this side too, you have them going in an opposite direction like that. You don't have to do every single layer, right? Just good enough. Just get it so that you get the basic idea. And for some of the foliage here, it's kind of hard to see what they are because it's very blurred, but it almost looks like an ovate sort of leaf. There's a little petiole there in the base. Give it a smooth margin, nice and simple. Don't have to worry about the veins or anything like that. Pinate. Right.
All right, there's our feathered friend right there. And just you can grab for your homework, your chisel tip pencil. And just get in here and just don't be afraid. Add a little base coat of material. And I'd recommend also if you have a little piece of scrap paper somewhere on the side, you can protect your work by putting the, whoops, by putting the piece of scrap paper over your pencil like this. And then uh, just add your base coat. Okay, and then continue building on that layer. So what I'll do is I'll continue working on this drawing as the video for, from today's class is rendering. And I'll send everybody an email with the lesson packet from today's class, as well as the recording and my finished drawing. And for all of our folks from the botanical drawing class from Thursday, I'll also be sending that drawing to you in a separate email. All right. So here's what we have so far. Okay, in today's class, we started out with our quick warm-up exercise of our butterfly. We added notes and we added some data points to help us make our drawings more information dense, but also to help add notes uh, like color and um, location-based information. Then we went on to work on our beautiful North American robin. And you can see we spent a lot of time on the head uh, going over the technique to use with the pencil to create the feather texture that we'll use throughout the rest of the piece. So I'm going to share my other camera with you again. Since we only have two minutes left, time flies. Okay. We have a, there we are. Excellent. So little bit of notes for you. If you're in our Earth Day class, I wanted, um, for anybody who didn't get to come to our Earth Day class, I talked a little bit about sharing your discoveries with other people. And now that, now that I've talked about it two or three times already, it feels like this is, a, this is a really great direction to start focusing your energy in. So now that you've learned a little bit more about nature drawing, right? It, it's a great way for you to help teach other people about the natural subjects that you're encountering on your hikes or in your own backyard. Um, it's an interesting and engaging activity, right? So even though you might not be perfect at it, you have the tools you need to get started and the tools you need to help other people get started too. So consider that. And if you take a fan, friend or a family member on a hike, maybe bring two pencils and two pieces of paper next time. And that way you can kind of help mentor, <laughs> you help, help mentor other budding artists. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a local community activity you can get involved in, I know that there are certain nature centers or even public libraries, um, consider getting involved and uh, either learning from somebody who has more experience than you, uh, or maybe even volunteering with a local uh, scout troop or a trail conference, something that gets you outside more, because that's part of it, right? Just spending more, out time, more, more time outside is, um, it's great and all. But if there's a little bit more extra motivation to do it, a little bit more intention, a little bit more focus, you're going to see that that's going to help you not only develop your nature drawing practice a little bit better, um, but also have, have your own hand on, in the environment that, uh, that you care about. Um, so you can always think about ways to display your best work. Uh, I've taken to making personal cards for people. So this month of May, it's, it's Mother's Day. We're going to be doing a class, a card, uh, basically a card making class for moms. And uh, this little card right here is uh, one that I made for my mom uh, for her birthday. So giving, giving your work as gifts to people is a great way to display your work. Also framing it you can contact local businesses and see if that, like a, a coffee shop wants to hang your work. Um, you know, and over the course of your, of your, tenure as a, as a nature artist, think about all the, all the hundreds of drawings you'll have created by then. You can do some uh, extra creative things like create calendars and make postcards and things like that too. If you're interested, we'd love to see the work you did in today's class uh, or any other work that you do outside of the class. You can go to facebook.com slash groups slash hike and draw and you can post your work there in the community. It's a great place to um, see what other people are doing in different parts of the world. We are a global community. So we have folks in Europe and Asia, in Australia, 
um, Northern America, South America. So people have different subjects that they're drawing and, and uh, different things that they're photographing. So it's a really great place to share your work. Um, we have some recommended reading if you're interested. I think a really fun way to really take advantage of spring is to start a nature journal. So the, uh, the naturalist's notebook is a really good one uh, to help you get started there. These are all clickable links, by the way, that you can interact with once I send this via email. And I also have some uh, digital resources for you as well to help continue uh, learning. Um, so for announcements, we have a series of different workshops this month. Uh, next is the Mother's Day card crafting workshop. It's basically a nature drawing workshop and we're just going to do that in a way that we can give that as a, as a present to our moms. Uh, we also have, um, if you're in the New York City area, I'm gonna be teaching a primitive navigation workshop in person in partnership with Adventure Untamed. So we're gonna be learning how to not, not only uh, tell which direction is north, but we're gonna learn how to navigate using the natural features of the land in addition to compasses as well. Uh, we have a color pencil workshop that's coming up. We have uh, a pangolin drawing workshop that I'm really excited about. I hope you guys sign up for that one. Um, we have our hike and draw community live draw coming up, which I'm going to be posting on the community page soon. And a brand new workshop, how to draw fantasy landscapes with illustrator Connor Nolan. That's a really cool one. And then we're going to be ending the month with the botanical drawing intro class for the uh, flame azalea. All of these workshops are posted or will be posted on the eventbrite.com um, page, eventbrite.hikeanddraw.com, uh, except for the community live draw, that's going to be on the Facebook only. If you like this class, if you like the recordings, we have a membership platform you can join to help support what Hike and Draw does. Uh, we have a collection of over two dozen workshops on our platform, and it keeps growing every single month. So we're going to have three dozen by the end of this month. So you can go and spend as much time, take the classes over and over and over and over again. And uh, it's not only a great way to help support what we do, but it's a great way to get practice. So thank you all very much for your time. I know I went a little bit over, but I enjoyed every second of it with you. Uh, if you feel so inclined, feel free to leave a tip. Uh, that's my Venmo handle right there. And uh, I'm gonna be posting this recording publicly. So you'll be able to share this with others. So thank you all so, so much. I hope you enjoyed this workshop as much as I did. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and um, I'll be happy to engage with you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, everybody, and I hope to see you all again real soon. Thank you.